Thank you, Leslie. Just wanted to uh, give you a brief overview about Eagle Certification Group. We were founded in 1994, so we've been in business for over 20 years. We're headquartered out of Dayton, Ohio. We have offices in Florida, California, Washington State, and Washington, D.C. We hold three accreditations through the ANAB, ANSI, and IAOB for our various certification schemes. We have 1,800 active certifications in 15 countries, and we use over 100 competent auditors to, to execute those, those and serve those clients. Here you can see our six core markets, and these markets really allow us to serve any type of industry, a variety of, of different clients, and of course with a, a strong focus in the food safety industry. Eagle is committed to the food industry, and that's demonstrated through our involvement in various industry organizations, including the GFSI Auditor Competency Technical Working Group and the Accreditation Task Force. We're a member of the SQF Auditor Competency Subcommittee. We're also members of the ASQ Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Division, the IAF co-chair of the Food Working Group, along with the IAAR Chair Food Task Force, and lastly, the FSSC, FSSC 22,000 Board, Board of Stakeholders. So we do uh, uh, have a, a, a very strong presence within uh, industry organizations. We're very proud. We've been recognized as the SQF Certification Body of the Year two years in a row in 2011 and 2012. And this past year, we had uh, one of our auditors recognized as the SQF Auditor of the Year. So what sets Eagle apart? We have one single point of contact for all of our customers so that uh, when you go to schedule and deal with uh, certification issuance and those type of, of things, you're dealing with one point of contact for, for consistency. Uh, we require ongoing training for our auditors to make sure they're staying up to date on the latest and greatest news from, from their respective industries. Our, our client satisfaction, we have over a 40% response rate with our surveys, and that uh, translates to a, our rating of a 4.55 out of a possible five. And then, of course, we offer free value-added training and WebEx and presentation uh, to act as a resource for our customers and others in the industry. I won't take any time away from Martin's presentation today. However, if you did have any questions, here's three convenient ways to, uh, to get a hold of Eagle, and we'd certainly uh, you know, welcome uh, helping you in any way. Now I'd like to uh, introduce Mr. Martin Fowl. Martin is a certification manager at Silica Global Certification Services and possesses over 15 years of food inspection, quality assurance, and auditing experience. A graduate of the University of Wisconsin, he began his career as a food safety inspector with the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection in Green Bay. In 2004, he joined Silicur, a Maryu Nutrisciences company, as an auditor and further honed his skills. Three years later, Martin was certified as a safe, quality food auditor. Since then, he has utilized his knowledge and auditing experience across a wide variety of industry sectors, conducting over 1,500 food safety and quality audits, many of them in accordance with the SQF code. Martin was promoted to regional auditing manager in 2010 and certification manager in 2013. Currently, he leads an expanding roster of cert certification auditors in North America and serves as a key silica representative to industry groups. As both a manager and mentor, he is an invaluable technical resource for many SQF auditors. Martin's commitment and evolution as an auditing professional has deservedly earned him the respect and admiration of his peers. Thanks for being with us today, Martin. All right. Well, thank you very much, and, and thanks to SQF for, for having me and, and giving me the opportunity to, to talk to all of you guys about, about the quality program. Um, I think SQF really has been on the forefront of quality, um, you know, being the, the GFSI scheme that, that incorporated quality into their program and into their level three criteria. I think it's really helped the industry and has, has really driven things forward. So we don't have a lot of time today to talk about it, but, you know, the quality program is a, a really big topic. There's a, a lot of things to cover. So what we're going to do is kind of hit on a few of the, the key, key points, the, the big things that, that you guys can use to, to help either develop or, or improve your quality program, depending on, on where you're at in the process. 
So a few things we want to talk about is, first of all, just defining quality, what it is and, and what it means. Uh, some basic steps for developing a, a risk-based quality program. Some common non-conformances we see. So when the auditors are out there in your plants looking at your programs, what are they finding? And, and hopefully these will give you guys some ideas on, on what you can do to, to prepare for it and, and how you can make your program uh, even better. Uh, the benefits of a successful quality plan. So basically it's really important to be able to, to show your management team, to show your boss, your CEO, that that what you're doing is important, and not only is it important, but it can also help your bottom line. It can improve your efficiencies and, and actually add to, to your profitability. And then finally, we should have some time left over for, for some questions and discussions, uh, the things that you guys need to, need to know or want to know. So first of all, what is quality? If you ask 100 different people, you're probably gonna come up with 100 different definitions for, for what quality means to them. Um, I did some Google searches, you know, kind of prepping for the webinar today, and what I found is there's a lot of different opinions out there, a lot of different thoughts on, on what quality is. The one thing I did notice, though, is it really seemed to be based on perspective. So depending on, on what you were looking for, what your background was, it had a big effect on, on what you considered quality. Um, that's why when you're developing your quality program, it's really important to know who is your end user. So. Before you start your quality plan, I think it's important for, for you as an organization to, to come up with your own definition of quality and to be able to kind of strive towards that goal. For the purposes of our presentation today, we're going to use the definition as a good quality product is one that consistently meets the needs of the consumer at the lowest cost to the producer. So this way we're kind of incorporating both sides of it, the needs of the customer along with the needs of, of you all as producers. So some of the basics for the quality plan. First of all, it is an SQF level three requirement. The quality plan is probably the, the biggest single difference between SQF level two and SQF level three. You know, there are uh, other additional requirements as, as you're looking towards SQF level three. Um, but the quality plan really is the basis and it really does encompass all of the other requirements as, as kind of part of that program. Uh, the quality plan should be created using HACCP principles uh, most of you have probably attended HACCP courses. You're probably very familiar with, with the, the seven principles of HACCP. What we want for the quality plan is, is you take those principles that you've learned for, for food safety and apply them towards quality. Uh, it's definitely not easy, but, but that's the idea and, and that's kind of the, the goal of the, the quality plan. Um, the other thing is that it really needs to be a process-based system. Um, but keep in mind that the focus needs to be on finished product conformance. One of the problems we sometimes see is that there's so much focus on the process side of things that people forget that, that it's really that end product is, is what's important. That's going to be what you're judged upon and, and that's going to be what the, the consumer sees. So as you start building your quality plan, you're going to find that the preliminary steps for, for quality are going to be very similar to the, to the food safety plan. A lot of these steps you've probably already completed as you know, you're part of your HACCP plan. Um, the first one's gonna be identifying the product. So we wanna know who's gonna be using this product. Is it gonna be something that's an ingredient in someone else's manufacturing process? Is it gonna be sold directly to the consumer? Is it gonna go through a restaurant or, or some other instit institution to be prepared before it gets to the consumer? When you're looking at that, you're going to be trying to determine what's important to the person who's, who's using it. Um, how is it going to be used? So pretty similar to HACCP there. Um, how will it be transported and stored? From a quality standpoint, you might be looking at different things. Um, you may have concerns with the temperature being too low versus the temperature being too high. Um, you know, if you're transporting product over high elevations, you may take into consideration different packaging requirements. Um, if it's going to be stacked into containers and shipped overseas, once again, that's all going to affect what you're looking at for quality and the types of threats that you need to consider. Um, then which characteristics are important? How is it likely to be misused? Those types of things, once again, very similar to food safety. Um, develop and verify the flow diagram. Once again, you've probably already done this as part of your HACCP plan. For quality, you want to make sure that you're including any process steps where the, the quality of that product could be affected, where it could be manipulated, um, things like that. 
So once you've got those preliminary, kind of the easy steps done, um, then you need to start thinking about what are your quality threats. What you're probably going to find is you're going to have a lot more quality threats than you do food safety threats. Food safety is typically categorized into the three main categories, the physical, chemical, and microbiological. For quality, these three may still apply, but in addition, you may have numerous other quality threats that you need to consider and, and think about as you're developing your plan. Uh, some of the common ones we see would be weight. So this could be weight of individual pieces. It could be weight of the, you know, the final container, uh, size, count, packaging. Um, all of those are, are really going to depend on, on who the end user is. If you're selling a bulk product, the, you know, the count might be more important than, than the individual weights. Uh, but keep that in mind. For sensory, this is one that's often very difficult to define, and we find that sites have a hard time really coming up with, with good limits for it. This includes things like color, flavor, texture. A lot of times the sensory ones are the ones that are most important to the, to the consumer, though. Those are the ones that, that they're going to see, they're going to feel, and they're going to taste. Uh, chemical quality threats could include things like salt, moisture, pH, these are typically um, threats if the product is being used by someone else, maybe as an ingredient in their product. So if their product needs to perform in a certain way, these are the types of controls you might have in place to make sure they're getting that, that product they need. And then microbiological, instead of being concerned with the pathogens for the quality plan, we're going to be concerned with things like, like spoilage organisms, yeast, molds, things like that that are going to affect the either the appearance, the, the flavor, texture of the product. Once you've identified what your threats are, uh, the next step is going to be to analyze those threats and determine how big of a risk they have to your organization. It's really important that when you're thinking about that risk, you consider the risk before the application of the controls. So many of, you many of you probably already have in place, you know, different quality programs where you're doing checks at a regular basis throughout your process. When you're analyzing the risk level, it's important to take those out of your mind and, and think about your process if you didn't have those controls in place, first of all, because that'll help you determine how risky it is to your business. Um, you're going to determine a risk level for each threat. So as you're going through your process steps, you may find that there may be a single process step that actually has multiple risks associated, multiple threats associated. Um, so each one of those threats needs to be analyzed separately. Uh, you're going to identify controls that you do have in place. So these would be the, the prerequisite programs you have in place for quality. Um, and it's important to remember, you're likely to find more critical quality control points than you would CCPs for food safety. Um, part of the reason for that is, is there's just a lot more quality threats out there, a lot more things that, that can affect the quality of the product versus, versus the food safety. You may find that when you do your quality analysis, it's very helpful to use a matrix. So what I've included here is a matrix. You may have seen this before in different training courses. But you can see that along the left-hand column there, it's, it's the consequence. So this would be anything from, from losing a customer or, or ceasing business um, all the way down to being commercially insignificant. The top line there talks about the, the frequency of, of a failure. So this could be anything from common to, to practically impossible to, to occur. When you develop this internally, you may actually change, change your consequences to, to make them more specific towards your business. The other thing that might be helpful would to be actually put some numerical values to the frequency. So you may determine that common is something that's probably going to happen once a day if you don't have controls in place. Um, you know, known to occur, you might determine that to be something that would happen monthly. Um, all the way down to practically impossible, you know, maybe it doesn't happen on a yearly basis. This will help you actually put some, some objectivity to the, to the risk analysis because you'll come up with a number, you know, in the case of this, this chart, it would be anywhere from 1 to 25. Um, and you can kind of see I've highlighted the, the lower numbers, you know, 1 through 10 in red, yellow numbers in yellow, numbers 11 through 15 in yellow, 
and then um, 16 to 25 in green. What that's going to help you with is actually determining which ones are most important to your business. Basically, which ones are critical to, to your business and your process. So a critical quality point is going to be a step where a quality threat can be prevented, eliminated, or reduced to an acceptable level. Pretty similar to HACCP there. Um, and then you're also going to have a lot of quality points. These may be steps in the process where if you lose control, it's not going to present a significant quality threat um, or it's not going to happen at a, on an unacceptable level. Keep in mind, though, that, that the quality points are the prerequisite programs and, and are really the foundation of, a, of the quality plan. For HACCP, you already have a lot of really well predefined prerequisite programs. You know, it's a requirement of probably every audit you've ever been through. For quality, those prerequisite programs aren't always as well defined. So it's really more important for, for you guys to define those and, and make sure that there's you know good programs in place, that you have monitoring records and, and all of that as well. But using kind of using this definition, and if you go back to the to the matrix, you can kind of identify, you know, the, the lower numbers, the one through ten, those might be ones that are critical because they're going to happen at a, a fairly regular basis, and there's going to be a big impact on your business if there's a failure at that step in the process. The ones in yellow you may determine, you know, could go either way, um, and you may need to reevaluate it after a, a certain amount of time. So as you're doing your, your reevaluation, you may determine that what isn't a, a CQP this year may actually end up being a CQP in the future or vice versa. Once you've identified your, your quality points and your critical quality points, you need to determine, you know, what are the limits. Once again, this can be pretty difficult because for food safety, it's, it's pretty cut and dry. You know, we know when, you know, at what temperature, what time salmonella is going to be killed. It's a little bit harder to determine that for quality because it, it is more subjective. Um, and because it is harder, you may initially focus on the, uh, the process steps that you deem to be critical. That'll help focus your energies, um, it'll help you kind of have a good starting point as to where you can start and, and where you can get the, the biggest bang for your buck. Uh, keep in mind though that, that all of the control points should be considered and as your program matures and, and as you kind of get those critical quality control points under control, then you can start expanding that to, to include the rest of the, the quality control points. Um, when you're developing the quality limits, it's really important to make sure that, that you're making finished products within specification. I mean, that is the goal, obviously, and, and so when you're determining what those quality limits are, you need to keep in mind that, that the finished product needs to be within spec. Make sure that you, you set limits that are achievable. Um, once again, it's, it's great to shoot for the stars and, and, you know, you want it to be the best as possible, but you need to make sure that you can meet those goals. Otherwise, what will happen is employees will get frustrated. Um, you'll end up putting a lot of product on hold maybe that doesn't need to be put on hold. So as you're looking at, at your process control points and what the limits are for those, be sure that you can correlate that to the finished product and, and the effect it's going to have there. Um, and finally, make sure they're available to all the responsible staff. It seems pretty obvious, but a lot of times when, you know, as an auditor, when we're out there interviewing employees, we find that, that they're really not aware of what the limits are or what the limits should be. Um, it's a good practice to actually have that information. You know, it could be right on the monitoring records if possible. Otherwise, make sure you have, you know, handy reference material. If it's something that's, you know, in a binder in the QA manager's office, most employees aren't going to feel comfortable, you know, going in there and asking the questions. So the more information you can get to the employee, the, the more readily available you can make it. The, the easier it's going to be and, and the more likely it is that, that people are actually going to be using it. Um, so you're going to have quality control points. The next step is going to be monitoring those control points. So you're going to record the data, you know, pretty obviously. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, I'm not going to spend any time, you know, just talking about regular records. I did want to spend a little bit of time, though, talking about process control charts. We don't have time to, to go into depth and, and really do a, a full in-depth analysis of SPC or, or process control. But I did want to mention them because I think they're, they can be a simple tool that you can use to, 
to really help the employees understand what's going on and, and to identify situations quickly to take corrective actions while you still have control of the process. Um, so the charts can be very simple. Um, they need to include upper and lower control limits. Um, they should be real-time measurements to allow for appropriate responses. So what I mean by that is, is they need to be actually out there being used on the floor so that employees have access to the information and they can make adjustments right then. It doesn't really do a lot of good to, to have process control charts that are being filled out after the fact. I'll see that once in a while where, you know, maybe the customer requires that you, you plot some of the data. So the people on the line record it all, they give it to the QA department, QA takes it in the office, types it up, puts it on a pretty graph, and, and send it, sends it to the customer. It's good that you're keeping your customer happy, but if you were actually taking that data and, and tracking it on the floor, then you would, you would be able to use it real time and, and make adjustments. Um, the, the last thing I have listed here is they should include procedures and rules for using the charts. Once again, for that one, the idea behind it would be that if you see a trend going a certain direction, you would be able to take action and kind of pull it the other way. So looking at the uh, the first example I put up here is, is just a simple example of, of how a simple process control chart would look. You can see on the chart here, uh, there's an upper tolerance limit, there's a target, and a lower tolerance limit. So the goal would obviously be the target line. When you're in the green, you can kind of keep on running the way you are. Everything's okay, you're in control. When you start hitting the yellow, then it would be expected that you would be making adjustments to the process whether it's slowing down a belt, turning up a temperature, uh, you know, changing the, a meter speed, things like that. You'd be taking actions, recording those actions, and basically being able to get the process back into control. As your, your program matures, as you start learning more and more about it, uh, you'll actually probably change the rules to, to make them even more, uh, more dynamic. So you may say, you know, if you have, you know, five different readings all on the same, you know, above the target or below the target, you may take action to kind of pull it closer to target. Um, once again, that's probably getting a little bit further out there once, once you get the basics down. Another example of a simple control chart here is, is one for temperature. I put this one in here because on this chart, if you look on the right-hand side, you can kind of see that there is a, actually a critical limit so for temperature, cook temperature, you may have a minimum limit that's critical for food safety, but on the upper side, you may actually have an upper limit that's acceptable for quality. So anytime there's a, a data point that's outside of those control limits, the auditor would expect to see uh, a corrective action. You know, something's taking place to, to make sure that that product isn't being shipped, whether it's for food safety or whether it's for quality. So speaking of corrective actions, um, your quality plan is going to require that you have corrective action plans established. We want you to know ahead of time what actions you need to take if there, you know, if there is a problem. Hopefully, if you have a good quality plan, you're going to be able to make those adjustments before the process is out of control. So your corrective action is actually going to be a, a change in the process. You know, like I mentioned, it may be slowing down a belt, speeding up a belt, changing a temperature. Something that you can do before the product is, is out of specification and, and before you have to put product on hold. Um, similar to corrective actions that you would have for other things, you know, you want to make sure that you determine the root cause if there is a determination. Implement the preventive measures, so it may be changing your, changing your targets, changing your limits. Um, and then I'd use that to identify areas for continuous improvement. So you're probably going to have a lot of data, a lot of information from your records. Um, and if you can use that information to, to, to improve your process, it's going to help you guys a lot. All right, then the next, you know, basic principle of HACCP would be verification. So the verification can include a, a variety of different tasks. Um, the first, probably the most simple, would just be the review of monitoring records. So we want to make sure that you're completing the tasks at the required frequencies making sure that the, the limits are being met. If there are any deviations from those limits, making sure that corrective actions have been completed. So, you know, we would expect that you, you keep a record of that record review, an additional sign-off on the sheet, things like that. 
Another thing that we that, that's often missed for the quality plan uh, would be the observation of employees conducting the tasks. So this would just be actually taking the time on a regular basis to go out there and watch the employees to make sure that they're following the right procedures, that they're not taking shortcuts, um, they're using the right equipment, and, and basically just following the procedures that, that you have written. Um, calibration of equipment and personnel is another very important part of, of verification. The equipment's pretty straightforward. You know, it's going to include things like meters, uh, measuring devices you use for quality, uh, those types of things. The harder one's going to be the calibration of personnel. What we mean by calibration of personnel would be making sure that uh, if two people are doing the task, they're getting the same results. So consistency, uh, this is especially important for, for sensory evaluations. You may have a team of, you know, maybe a half a dozen or, or even more people who are all doing, you know, taste tests on the product. We want to make sure that, that each of those employees is coming up with the same results when they, when they check the same product. Um, and then finally, external verification where appropriate. This could be an external company coming in to calibrate your equipment. It could be, you know, sending samples out to an outside laboratory to, to have some additional quality tests performed on them. And then taking that information, reviewing it against the results you get to make sure that, that you are consistent and that you are, you know, basically getting the uh, results that you're looking for. Validation of the quality plan is another, another important part of it. For validation, what I've done here is I've listed some questions that you can ask yourself as you're going through the validation process. Uh, first of all, is your overall quality plan effective? So what we're looking for is, is how do you know that, that what you're doing is working? That all these control points you have in place, the, the critical control points, the frequency you're monitoring them, how do you know that all of that is working? A lot of times, you know, you'll be looking at the data, you know, looking for trends in, in the monitoring records, looking at what the customers are telling you, looking at your complaints, your positive feedback, um, and then trying to correlate that to, you know, kind of correlate it back to your process. So are your CQPs and limits effective? If you're, you know, if you're making a lot of product and, and you have your CQP set up so you're only checking it, you know, once a day, you might may find that there's a lot of process variation throughout the day, and you may need to be doing your, your CQP checks much more frequently. Um, that's all going to be something you find during your during your validation. Uh, sample size is another another important thing to to think about as you're validating. Uh, you want to make sure that you have a sufficient sample size to get a result that's that's indicative of of what you're making. Uh, results of sensory evaluations really important for quality that that you actually have someone testing that product to see if it's, it's going to meet those sensory, evaluate or sensory requirements that your customer has. Uh, I've mentioned what are your customers telling you, and then what is the data telling you. Um, if, if you set up your, your monitoring in, in a way that, that gives you access to a lot of data, it's really going to help you to be able to, to see if your process is in control and to see if, if it's really working for you. So next, we get to talk about the fun stuff. Um, basically, what the auditor finds. Uh, I do quite a few audits still, um, and, I, and I do a lot of reviews of, of reports. So I didn't, you know, look at the numbers specifically. But what I did is I kind of just, over the last year or so, looked at some of the, the common nonconformances we're seeing for sites that that are level three certified right now, or you know, maybe sites that are looking towards level three certification. The, the first common nonconformance we see is that the threat analysis is incomplete and likely threats have not been considered. What I mean by this is during the, during the risk analysis, the, the site may have identified, you know, two or three quality attributes, but they really haven't identified all of the rest of the quality problems that could occur with the product. Um, you know, as an auditor going in, it's, it's hard to know what problems they're having. So, one of the questions I'll usually ask as I'm looking at the, the the quality threat analysis would be, you know, what are your top three complaints? You know, over the last year, what are the, the, the top three things that people have complained about? And an easy way to check is, you know, just to say, hey, have you addressed those quality hazards there? 
um, key product characteristics, a lot of times this will come from the, the customer, especially if your product is, is going to be used by another manufacturing site. So I get that information from the specifications. So if your customer is giving you a specification that has you know, certain moisture, certain pH requirements, those are all hazards that, that I would expect to see it addressed in your, your risk analysis. Um, also want to make sure that you're including site-specific threats. Sometimes it's, you know, it's easy to take someone else's quality plan and, and you know, change the name, put your name on it, maybe make a few changes to the people and then use it as your own. But really what we're looking for is, is to have that quality plan to be site specific. Um, you know, your site may have different characteristics about it that affect quality that, that may not apply to, to a sister plant. Um, it could be things like you know, different equipment, older equipment versus newer equipment. All of that is, is going to have an effect on, on how likely a, a problem is to occur. So it's something that, that needs to be considered when you're, when you're doing your site-specific hazard analysis. This, the next one is, is probably one of the more common things we see as auditors. Um, a site has identified a single CQP, um, and that is finished product testing. You know, I, I, finished product testing is, is definitely very important, and it's, uh, you know, it's a really big part of, of verification and validation. Unfortunately, though, just using a finished product testing as a CQP isn't really process-based. If you're waiting until the product is made and then checking it, it's too late, too late to make any adjustments. Um, if there is a problem with that product, you're going to end up putting it on hold. It's going to end up costing, you know, costing money, and, and you've really lost that opportunity to, to make the product right the first time. Um, another problem you know, with, with just using finished product testing as a CQP is it's really hard to get a sufficient sample size. Um, if your product is very homogeneous, if, if everything's the same, you know, it may be possible, but if you get any variability at all, it, it's really difficult to sample enough product to actually have a, a scientifically valid level of confidence in it. Um, and, and generally speaking, it, it just results in, in an increased failure cost because, once again, you're waiting until the product is already made before you're checking it. That pretty much is, is too late then to take actions and, and fix any problems you may have. Another common nonconformance that auditors find is, is that programs are not established for monitoring the non-critical control points. So the site may have identified you know, two or three or maybe even a half a dozen critical quality control points, but they really haven't spent any time analyzing and, and looking at the, the prerequisite programs for quality. So we want to make sure that as you guys are developing your quality plan, that you have SOPs and work instructions for the control points as well as the critical quality control points. Um, you know, making sure employees are aware of the programs. So when we're out on the floor interviewing employees, making sure that, that they know about the, the non-CQP programs as well as the, the CQP programs. Uh, making sure you're maintaining records for the quality uh, control points and then making sure you're taking corrective actions. Even if, it's, even if it's not critical to quality, we would still expect that, that corrective actions would be taken. Uh, another, another common nonconformance we find is, is that equipment and personnel used for quality are not properly calibrated. A lot of times there's a lot more equipment that's being used for the quality checks versus the food safety checks. So these include things like, um, you know, meters for ingredients, uh, scales that are being used for, for maybe minor ingredients, uh, finished product scales, thermometers for quality, color charts. Color charts are a good one where a lot of times the color chart may be posted on the wall since, you know, 1957, and they're still using that, but no one's actually checked to make sure that it's not faded and, and to make sure that there haven't been changes. And then once again, the sensory evaluators, you know, really making sure that the people who are doing sensory evaluations on your product are calibrated, that you're doing some, some cross checks with them to make sure that everyone's getting the, the same results. A um, couple more, just quick ones. Corrective actions are not taken when the quality limits are, are exceeded. One of the reasons we see this happening is, is that the quality limits have been set at, at unachievable levels. So, You've set your goal so high that it's just impossible to meet it, 
And then what happens is employees get frustrated. You know, they know it's not going to work. So instead of taking action, people just get used to it, and, and it really builds a kind of a bad quality culture. Um, then the quality limits are not reflective of the process. Once again, if, if you're measuring something that, that doesn't have an effect on finished product, it's probably not going to be very beneficial to you. And then, you know, quality plans not properly validated. Really, you know, the, the validation needs to include a lot of different things, um, and it really needs to look at all aspects of the program. So now that we've talked a little bit about, you know, kind of building building the quality plan, uh, some of the key tasks the tasks you need to complete, um, we'll kind of get into a little bit about the benefits of a quality plan. But before we talk about the, the benefits, we, we need to talk about the cost of, cost of quality. So that way you can kind of think about, you know, where 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 things are costing your, your company money and then what you can do to improve them. So a, a simple measurement for the cost of quality would be the real cost of making product, the mistakes and all, um, minus the cost that it would have costed you if you made it right the first time. And that's going to equal the, the cost of quality. Typically, when we when we talk about cost of quality, we break it into three main categories. The first one would be the prevention cost. This is really the one where you're going to get the most bang for your buck. Uh, this would include investments in quality, training, preventive maintenance, process controls. Really, this is all of the things you do to make the product right the first time. Um, the appraisal costs, those are going to be things like inspections, equipment, calibrations, uh, things that that you're doing to measure and, and see if you're meeting quality. And then the last one's the failure cost. Typically we find that the failure costs are the most expensive costs when it comes to quality. Um, part of the reason is because they're, they're the highest cost items. It includes things like rework, downgrades, recalls, and, and probably most, most importantly, reputation. It's really hard to, to put a value on a company's reputation um, but we've all been there before, and we, we all know products where we see them in the grocery store. We've you know maybe had a couple bad experiences with them, so we, we just avoid them, and, and we're willing to pay more for a product because we know we're going to get the, the quality we expect. Um, so basically, the benefits of the quality plan. First of all, it's going to be a more efficient use of resources. So if you have a good quality program in place, and if you're maintaining control of the process versus just waiting until the, the finished product is made. You're going to need less resources for customer complaints and, and product withdrawals. So the people who would, would normally be handling customer complaints or, or withdrawals or recalls could actually be doing other things for your organization. Uh, there hopefully will be a reduction in the internal failures. So you're going to have less costs associated with rework and reinspection and less waste and downgrades. You know, that's a benefit for, for not only the, the bottom line, but environmentally. Um, you know, hopefully you'll have less packaging waste, less, uh, less time spent, less energy, all of that type of stuff if you have a quality plan in place that, that focuses on the process. Uh, you're going to give yourself a, a competitive advantage. So basically making good product consistently, you're going to be meeting your customer needs, uh, differentiating yourself from the competition, and, and really building brand reputation, whether it's with the consumers or uh, retailers, uh, food service people. Uh, customer satisfaction and repeat customers. Like I mentioned, we've, we've all been there before where we know which products are good and, and which ones maybe aren't so good. Uh, and then finally, more sales. Add in their reduced waste, and you're going to have increased profits. It's always great to be able to go to your, your CEO and, and actually show them numbers to say, hey, you know what? Over the last year, we've been able to save this much money because we've implemented this, this quality plan. We're checking the process as things are being made. We're not waiting till, till the end of the line before we find out if it's good or not. And that's going to, it's really going to help your company and it's going to just make the, the organization a better organization. So finally, some, some kind of closing things to consider as you're, as you're building your, your quality plan. First of all, make sure you identify the right quality team. You're going to want people on the team who are energetic, who, who really buy into it. You're going to want people who have good ideas, uh, people who are willing to work hard. Um, and, and that's going to help you develop the right culture. So, so the culture in the, the organization is, is so important. 
um, you know, having people who, who really believe in the process, it, it's going to make the difference between success or failure. Um, getting cooperation at all levels. Uh, you know, it's really great if the CEO of the company is on board, but if the people on the line aren't on board also, it's going to be really hard to, to make that program work. Um, set goals for yourself. So, so what I mean by that is, is really identify where you want to be. Um, make sure that, that you have that, that goal in mind as you're building your quality plan. Um, set some targets for yourself so you can monitor your progress. Uh, find ways to improve the process. So as you, you know, maybe you're going to have meetings where you all get together and, and just talk about what's happening, what you're seeing, um, and then find ways to, to keep making that better. Basically, that all, all boils down into the, the plan, do, check, act process. It's that kind of that continual process of, of continuous improvement. So I know that was actually pretty quick, but hopefully that, that gave you a, a real quick, brief overview of, of some of the basic steps for a quality plan. Um, you're going to find that, that each plant is a little bit different. You're, everyone's probably going to approach it a, a little bit different way, uh, but hopefully that was able to help you out a little bit and give you a, a few ideas to start with. Okay, thank you so much, Martin. We really appreciate your presentation. Um, I did send a couple um, questions that came in into the chat section, so I don't know if you just want to scroll to the top and then take a look um, at what we have there and where would be a good place to start. I think I am getting a couple more um, questions coming into the Q&A section, so I'm just going to take a look at that really quickly and also send that over to you. Um, but yeah. All right. That's Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so the first question was CQP means critical quality point. Yeah. Um, you know, every plant will will call it something different. Typically, what we see is CQP for for critical quality point. Sometimes we'll see that QCP. Um, various ways of saying it, but that's what it is. Uh, the next question we had was, what is your opinion regarding the use of a matrix based on low, medium, high versus a numerical matrix? What I would say about, you know, I, I guess personally I like the numerical matrix because it breaks it down a little bit further. So instead of only having the three categories, the low, medium, and high, there's a little bit more variability in it. Um, what I see sometimes uh, the site is lacking if they just use low, medium, and high is, is the justification for, for why they determined it was low, medium, or high. Um, but I think if, if you have good justification, if you really identify the definitions for low, medium, and high, then it's, it's a way that works for, for a lot of people. Um, the next question we have is, for external verification, we participate in a cross-check program. There are several suppliers in our industry, and we share blind samples to see what range of variation is within the industry. Um, I, I think that's a, that's a great way of doing it. Um, one of the things you're going to want to do with your quality program is is compare yourself to the competition. So using a cross-check program, um, you know, sometimes we'll see, uh, I hate to use this analogy, but, you know, you have the store brand versus the national brand. And if the national brand is what you're trying to emulate, then then definitely comparing yourself to that and, and using that as a reference point can be, can be very ben beneficial. Um, the, the next question is one, you know, kind of interested in, in offline information. Uh, you know, definitely any of the CBs, Eagle has a, has a great group, uh, you know, us here at Silicur, um, there's a lot of registered SQF consultants out there who could al also help you. Um, there's also going to be a training course uh, held in conjunction with the SQF conference. I don't have the information right here in front of me right now. Uh, but I believe it would be the day before the conference. Uh, it should be available on the SQF website. But there is going to be a like an eight-hour course on, on developing a quality plan. Information should be available on the SQF website. Uh, to find an example of a quality plan, you know, I would definitely recommend going to a, going to a quality training course if you could. Um, there aren't really a lot of specific examples for quality plans out there because what we find is, is typically each plant comes up with their, their own. Um, 
kind of just as an auditor, some of the, the plans I've seen that are really good are plans that actually identify all of the control points in the process, um, you know, kind of a matrix format, along with the monitoring procedures, the acceptable limits, and the frequency for monitoring. It makes it really easy for, for you as a company to see the whole picture right there, black and white, simple matrix format. Um, it, it is something that, that does seem to be helpful for, for some people. The next question I have is, um, if corrective actions need to be taken each time a critical limit is, is uh, detected, or if it's only necessary to take corrections? Great question. I, I think I know what you're asking. Basically, cor corrections versus corrective actions. It's uh, a topic we run into an awful lot as, as auditors out there because really we want to see that, that if you are having repeat deviations, that you're getting to the root cause and, and not just always put a, putting a correction on it. Um, what I typically find is most of the time, if, if you take a, if, if you do a correction, subconsciously you are thinking about the root cause analysis. Um, so I guess to answer your question, what I would say is it is necessary to take corrections anytime you deviate. The corrective action would be, you know, if, you know, depending on severity, the repeat issues, things like that. Um, Another question, is the quality team similar to the crisis team, HACCP team? I would say definitely. You, you know, you want the quality team to be a cross-functional team. Uh, you want to include people from, from all different aspects of the business. Um, you know, especially, I think, for the quality team, it's, it's important to include, you know, the R&D people, the sales people, um, you know, maybe people who may or may, may not be really active on the HACCP team. But I think they're going to play a really big role in, in determining what is, you know, what is quality. Uh, the salespeople are going to really be able to help, help you by telling you what the customers are telling them. Um, the R&D people need to be on there because they're the ones who are, who are making these new products, and, and you need to be able to, to produce them to their specifications. Um, Another question we have here is, uh, what is required in terms of sensory analysis and level three SQF? Uh, what will the auditor look for, and should the fa facility have a sensory panel or send to a test laboratory? I think that one's really going to depend on on what your product is. When you go through your quality risk analysis, you're going to determine, you know, kind of which which sensory analyses are, are important. If you have the, the qualifications and if you can train people internally, then I think that's probably going to be the easiest kind of on a, on a daily basis to do the checks. Uh, you're definitely probably going to want to enlist the help of, of possibly a sensory panel or an outside laboratory if you're, you know, to kind of validate or, or verify what you are doing. So that could be your, your calibration of people would be sending it to an expert, making sure that you're, you're getting the same results. Um, a couple other ones here, just kind of generic outside information. You know, I, I would definitely, in, in you know, in terms of, of books to read or, or places to go for quality information, um, you know, definitely the SQF website, I always recommend that. Any training courses you can go to, those are always great. Um, Another quick question on can the quality team and the HACCP team be the same? Definitely, no problem with that at all. Um, in, in a lot of the, you know, like I mentioned, a lot of the preliminary steps are going to be the same in terms of, you know, product descriptions, flow diagrams, things like that. Uh, really just want to make sure that that when you're doing that, you're, you're, you're considering the quality aspects of the, of the product. So I think that's all of the questions, any any additional ones? Leslie? I think I sent everything I saw over to you. Um, of course, if there is any question that was missed, um, let's see if we can go back to your contact information. Um, you guys can always shoot him an email if you 
um, if for some reason we missed your question, or also, um, you know, if you guys think of anything later, that's that's always an option. Let's see. Yeah. I, I do I do see a couple couple more questions here that that looks like oh. they just came in. Uh, one would okay. be: Is it a debit? Is it a debit if we have a finished product testing as our single CQP? I was actually waiting for someone to ask that question, and I, I almost wish you wouldn't have because it's a really hard question to answer. What I typically do, and, and I get this question fairly regularly, I, I turn the question back around to you and say, are, are you okay with finished product testing being the, the only CQP? And, and I think if you think about it, um, think about it in terms of food safety, would you be okay with finished product testing be the, being the only control you had in place to control salmonella, listeria, or, or whatever the, the hazard is? I think in most cases you're gonna say no, and then you're going to want to have have steps in the process to control those. So, just it's it's a good question, and it's one we run into actually fairly frequently. So that's that. Okay, I just sent um, a couple others to you in the chat section. I, you may have covered one of them already, but um, I'm not sure. All right. Um, one of them here is, uh, would you include the quality pro program in internal auditing? Most definitely. Um, you know, your internal audit program needs to include your entire food safety management and, and quality management system. Um, I believe SQFI has, has had a learning lunch on inter internal audits, um, and it was a really good one. Uh, there are also a lot of training courses out there for internal auditing. Um, a little bit off subject from from the quality plan, but but definitely it's an it's another nonconformance that we see a lot as auditors is people focus on the facility inspections versus a a true audit of of their food safety and food quality management system. So if you're a level two certified site right now and you're moving to level three certification, one of the the changes we would expect to see would be a change in that internal audit program to encompass the, the quality plan, the quality control points, and, and definitely any, any CQPs. Uh, for another question just came through is, is documentation required for personnel calibration? You know, definitely. Once again, if, if, it, if we don't have a record of it, it's, it's hard for us as auditors to, to know that it actually happened. Um, so I would recommend, you know, definitely it would be required to keep the records for personnel, personnel calibrations. And it may just be a matter of looking at the data, comparing it, and, and making sure everyone is on the, on the same page. Um, one, one last question here it looks like. Is the older system of reasonably likely to occur and not reasonably likely to occur still acceptable? I would say it is still acceptable, but really want to make sure that you can justify your decision. So, so making sure that you have the, the background information, the background data to support why you determined that it was reasonably, reasonably likely or not reasonably likely to occur. And I think that's all. Oh, I just sent um, two others to you. Sorry, I think it's messing up the order. And then um, they just keep coming. <laughs> All right. I, I probably talk a little faster than I should, so so that's great, actually. Um, so how many levels are there? Uh, for SQF certification, uh, level one, level two, and level three, we, we rarely see any level one audits. Um, level two is the most common. Level three would be the... Uh, the you know next most common. Another question is uh, for CCP deviation, it's important to take a corrective action. Um, not exactly sure what we mean by this question. I think what we're asking is if it's a CQP deviation such as metal detector failure, do we need to take corrective action? Uh, that is correct. You would need to take corrective actions. Also need to make sure that you're recording the corrective actions that you do take um, and taking those into consideration when you're doing your management reviews. And 
Next question, is it acceptable to do a routine check throughout the process, such as weighing every sixth log of dough, but only record the average of the data or record the supervisor's random observed check of the control by the staff person? Once again, what I would say is this is this is going to depend on the risk to product. If, you, if you've determined that the weight of that dough piece is critical to quality, then I would expect a record for, for each of the checks. Um, if, if you have six different, you know, if it's a, a belt that has maybe six or a dozen different uh, mechanisms that, that create that dough ball, you may actually want to record each one individually since there could be a variation in the process. And you may have one, you know, depositor that's not working while the other five or six are. Um, so what I would say is I would definitely base the routine checks on risk. The more risk there is to your business, the more frequent, the more, the more records you're probably going to keep. And then the last one, we have put sensory evaluation as a CQP, but you have, have, have several CPs along the way. Would that be okay? What I would do is I would take a look at those CPs and, and really determine if they're critical or not. Um, once again, typically finished product testing is a way you're going to, to kind of validate that your control points are working. Um, if that's your only CQP, the, the question I would have for you would really be, is it process-based and is there anything you can do at that point to, to fix the product or, or is it already going to have to be rework or, or waste? So with that, I, I definitely want to thank all of you. Um, I want to put in a little plug for the SQF conference. Um, you know, I go to a few scheme owners, and, and I have to say the SQF conference is, is by far, I think, the, the most educational, the most dynamic, and, and the one that's actually most fun. <laughs> so I appreciate all of you guys being here, and I'll turn it back over to you, Leslie. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your presentation. I, it was really interesting, and I think everyone here got a lot from that. You got a lot of kudos in the chat section here. Um, and just a note to everyone, just another reminder, you will be able to access this again. Um, we have recorded the session and also the Q&A that we had here at the end. I would look for this up on the events tab of the SQFI website. You should see that up there in about a week. Um, we do get emails immediately after the presentation, you know, asking about, you know, if they can receive the recording. But it does take me a little bit of time to download and edit and convert that. Um, I give it a week just kind of like as a safety buffer. But it should be up at least by the end of next week. But thank you so much, everyone, for your time. We were really happy to have you with us. And uh, a big thank you to Martin. And let's see, hopefully we'll see you back here next month for our next Learning Lunch. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day.